morning from Toronto, Canada, and good afternoon and good evening to all joining us from across the world on Zoom and Facebook Live. Welcome to Green Hope Foundation's webinar on building resilient societies through gender equality. My name is Gehkesha, and I am the founder president of Green Hope Foundation. I am delighted to be your moderator for this webinar. My colleague Anshita, chapter head of Green Hope Foundation India, will be live tweeting this event. Now, in the past few weeks, in the full glare of the global media, millions of women and girls in Afghanistan are being made invisible while the world's superpowers watch mutely. And by allowing this gross violation, it makes them as culpable as the perpetrators. Yet this sorry chapter is just another example of uh, women and girls' rights continuing to be alienated from human rights. This pandemic that has upturned our lives since uh, the last year and a half is another glaring example of how women's inequality gets amplified during crisis and disasters, large or small. We at Green Hope have been working in rural communities and LDCs that witnessed an exponential rise in child marriages when the first lockdowns began. And every economic downturn hits us as women and girls the hardest, yet the reverse is never true. Booming economies rarely translate to a similar rise in women's employment and benefits. So from boardrooms to farmlands, we continue to be deprived. We are one half of humanity, and yet we are constantly forced to take on multiple roles and responsibilities that don't remunerate us fairly, and we continue to be typecast as well. Honestly, the only silver lining for us that uh, seems to be there now is a greater awareness now more than ever before that our rights undeniably equate to human rights because the pandemic has given rise to a new awakening. How effectively we will ride this wave will determine whether we can truly make substantive progress and rebuild better and build forward better for women and humanity. So today we are privileged to have with us an eminent panel of leaders who are shining inspirational icons in their field. And we're really looking forward to hearing their insights on how we should change the narrative to build a more gender equal world for all where no one is left behind. So on that note, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Chandeline Carpentier, Chief UNCTAD New York Office of the Secretary General. Chandeline, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kikeshan, and I couldn't. You couldn't agree more with you that you know the the <clears throat> the the effect of the pandemic are universal, but the ability of people and countries to mitigate those those impact are vastly different, and then therefore the inequalities are growing because of these asymmetries, inabilities to respond, both women, men, uh, uh, or, or countries, poor country, uh, and richer country. I'll just give one statistics. Um, basically, developed nations have put up to an average $10,000 per capita in stimulus packages to support their population. That number for the poorest countries on the planet is 200 per person. And so it's 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 humongous. And so, um, but having said that, what I want to do because you had very good question, Kikashan, and I want to read them and address them all at once <laughs> uh, through the work that we do at UNTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development. So you ask us, what's the challenge? The challenge of gender equality, often regional and even community specific. So what can be done? Um, to, to, to find local solution to these global issues. How, uh, and the development state, development policies, could, uh, I want to address that, of course. Climate change and biodiversity changes affecting women disproportionately, and then the role of, of, of youth. So what I want to do is share my screen with you, and I try to address all of this at once, and see if I, you tell me if I, I managed to do that or not. <laughs> um, let me see, I believe this is it. Um, all right. So um, could you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Excellent. So 
first, I want to go back to the origin of sustainable development, right? Because one of the things is that the Secretary General of the UN has said is that we, if we had to invest more in the SDGs, we would not be so far behind and the impact on social and planet would have not been so harsh of the COVID-19 or any crisis, right? And right from the get-go in 1992, in the Rio Declaration Principle, it right away said that acknowledged the role of women in sustainable development and said, women have a vital role in environmental management and development. And yet we haven't done, we haven't done much about that. And why gender equality is important is because if you have gender equality, it actually promotes long-term growth because better educated income earning women invest more on their wealth, of their wealth than men do in their children's education, health, nutrition, and their community. Um, Having said that, what is it that we can do? Well, first we need to realize that policies are not neutral. Gender, um, it's, so there's a one gender goal, which is gender SDG five in the SDGs, but we also have an, an inequality goal, which is SDG 10. But this inequality is also, and the gender lens is also throughout the SDGs, such as empowerment of women entrepreneurs and traders on SDG uh, target 5B, support of productive capacity, decent job creation of entrepreneurship, creativity, blah, 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 of MSMEs, especially those owned by women, improve access to financial services for these MSMEs. Women have much more harder time getting access to uh, financial services than men, as well as to connect to their suppliers and in increase the export uh, from developing countries, ex including women exporters. So what I want to do is, explain a little bit through UNCTAD what the UN system has been doing. So we now have, at the request of the Secretary General, included the gender lens in every one of our research. So basically each of our flagship report has a section that address um, what's the, 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 the gender impact. Now what I want to do is to show you that, um, that we could be resolving a lot of issues. I'm trying to move my screen because things are moving in the wrong direction. Okay, so basically, how do we do that, right? How do we empower women to own businesses, to be able to take advantage of export and, and e-commerce, um, especially in this COVID-19 era? Well, first we need to raise awareness and the capacity of women to take advantage of the business opportunities related to the SDGs. 755 million people still lack access to basic drinking water. That's a business of opportunity for women entrepreneurs. 3 billion people without basic and washing facility at home. That's a business opportunity for women entrepreneur and so on. Each of these is a business opportunity. But women need our help. UNCTAD has an E-Trade for, uh, e for All initiative. And after a year, we realized we needed to have a dedicated section for E-Trade for Women because women trading have different uh, challenges, additional challenges than men. And especially in the digital space, younger women in the world needed to have role model that they can look up to. They can see themselves in these, in these women and know that they can have a future in these areas. So we basically created the E-Trade for Women. We have a cohort, one woman in the digital space in each part of the world, uh, e uh, French speaking, English speaking, Africa, Latin America, Asia. And basically their job is to help the other women, we connect them into networks and they can support each other. Often they find it hard uh, because they don't have that network to talk to. It's hard to be an entrepreneur, help them connect to market, but also to policymakers to make it easier um, to, to have the right policies in place. We also help women um, um, border trading. A lot of the border trading of these essential commodities are done by women, yet it, they're illegal, they don't know the rule, they get abused, they get um, taken advantage of. We, by educating them and educating the decision makers, we can actually help their women help us because they're actually providing a services that is necessary and yet they, get, um, they do not get our support in doing so. We also promote women entrepreneurship uh, and, um, and the women in business award actually help connect with these winners and these um, top women that have been selected, we connect them to mentors, entrepreneurs from around the world so that they can actually not only get the money, but the mentorship to go forward. And these are more general, not just in the digital space. So how do we do that, right? How do we empower women entrepreneurs? Not just in, women would tend to go in these traditional sectors, which have been heavily hit by the COVID, services sector, health sector, uh, and low growth sector. So we need to actually empower women to take advantage 
of the SDG growth sectors. So what are those clean energy? How do we not only deploy clean energy, but make sure women own the asset in that, in the, they own the renewable energy production system, that they actually are the leaders and own the business in sustainable food, in information communication services, good health and well-being, quality education, and nature-based solutions to respond to SDG 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So we could, Kakashan, by focusing our capacity building, our support and policies to women entrepreneurs actually address, not only redress from the, the, the pandemic, but empower women and address inequality that were pre-existing before the pandemic so that they don't come back and they're already behind again, but they're on top or they make their way to the top coming out. And why would that be important? Because women tend to be better collaborators in, in, in collaboration. And we know the SDGs, we need to collaborate to advance them. They are usually better at balancing diverse type of person around them and find creative solution that men just can't see because these women see problem and women's problem in a different way than men would do because we have different experience. Um, so, and then we do that also through sustainable stock exchanges because guess what? 2% of the venture money goes to these women. So women's innovative ideas and solutions do not see the light of the day and get to market. So we need to solve the financing issues. And that we do through our sustainable stock exchange initiative where we can reach many more companies at once through the stock exchanges where they're listed. And we do it through the, the, the Secretary General response of, of the COVID-19 through micro and small medium enterprises and formalization of the sectors, supporting them with our sister agencies. Um, I want to just conclude, Kekashan, because I think I've used my time. In, in your last question was, what, is, what are the youth able to do? What could they do? We need advocacy. There's been $17 trillion put out in stimulus packages right now. A, a huge amount of that money needs to go to developing countries. 50% of that money should go to women entrepreneurs and MSMEs if we actually want to get out of this crisis on top, not at the bottom. And I invite you, this is a little plug, we have UNCTAD 15 in Barbados, 3 to 8 of October, and all of these issues we will be discussing there. So we invite you, we have a youth forum, we have an NGO forum, um, and you're all most than more welcome to join us. Thank you and over to you. Thank you so much, Chandeline, first of all, for sharing the work that UNCTAD is doing and highlighting how important it is right now that, you know, the pandemic has shown us like where we've gone wrong, especially in uh, you know, in addressing gender equality in the time, and the uh, is now ripe for women and girls, and to em ensure that their empowerment leads to them taking on jobs in sectors that previously, you know, they weren't necessarily in, like, as you said, clean energy and IT. So thank you so much for sharing that uh, with us. And I shall now like to invite our next panelist, Dr. Lauren Rumble, UNICEF Principal Advisor, Gender and Chief of Gender and Rights Section of the Program Division. Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hikashan. What a pleasure it is to be here with all of you. And I keep seeing the participant numbers jumping up. Um, it's a great honor to be here and listen to your questions later in the discussion. I'm going to focus building on Chanteline's excellent presentation. I'm going to do a deep dive now on girls as agents of change and opportunities. Um, so I'm going to just start with a video. Bear with me while I share my screen. And, uh, can you see the screen, everybody? Yes. Okay. Um, so let me just give us a start here. This virus doesn't discriminate, but its consequences do. As families become poorer, millions more girls are forced into early marriage. Lockdowns can protect from the virus, but they don't protect girls and women from domestic violence. When schools and clinics close their doors, you lose not only our teachers and doctors, but our mentors, our friends, our safe spaces. We often find ourselves on the wrong side of a digital divide, far from connectivity and tech devices. Taken further from our dreams to learn and be heard, But change is happening. Our diversity is our strength. 
amplify our stories, provide platforms that allow us to be heard. We support each other and continue to support us. We shape solutions that are fit for us. Our reality is online and off. We build back better. Together. I hope you enjoyed that video as much as I did. It's led by a young feminist activist working in India um, for girls' rights there and we a uh, voice of youth in UNICEF's programming. I'm now going to also share with you a couple of slides just to take you through my presentation. And just like Chantel checked, I'm checking it's working. Can everybody see that first one? Um, okay, wonderful. So please feel free to pop your comments on the video, whether you liked it, whether it resonated with you, what you took away from it, into the chat box. I'd love to hear your feedback. Not that many people have seen it yet. It's brand new. And the focus of that video, as I hope you captured, is about girls leading change directly, not only as subjects of our support and assistance, but as direct agents of change. And even when bureaucratic systems, governments, organizations like my own are too slow to respond, girls and women remain on the front lines. We've seen that over and over again in the COVID-19 crisis. Pictured here, for example, is Mona, who is a young activist in Colombia that during the COVID-19 crisis took over community radio and to spread messages about COVID-19, how to protect from it um, in local indigenous languages for other young people. And we see examples like Mona from around the world that even when they themselves are under tremendous personal pressures, living in poverty, under strain from their families to marry young, they're still determined to make the world a better place with very little resources at their disposal. I believe Kekashan touched on this a little bit, as did the video. We know that COVID-19 has had a massive, unprecedented impact on societies everywhere, and arguably, and of course I have a special bias here, especially on girls. The, what the graph on the left is telling us is that even before the COVID-19 epidemic struck, we were looking at 100 million girls at risk of child marriage before 2030. Now, because of the crisis, because of school closures, because of girls being locked at home, sometimes with violence abusers, and the lack of opportunities they may have as societies grapple with economic challenges, as Karolinka talked about, um, child marriage is even more of a risk, and we estimate an additional 10 million child brides by 2030. What does that mean? We're far off track from being the modern progressive societies we want to see for ourselves and the sustainable development goals vision. On the right, I have a picture of a young girl who's just 15, Asma, who's in Yemen a country that was really beset by war and conflict even before COVID hit. And then COVID's devastating impacts of shuttering down schools and services. Organizations like mine had to struggle harder than ever before to provide emergency education. And so girls like Asma living in um, displaced settlement communities have to rely on their education when they don't have internet access, they don't have a school building to go to, they don't have their normal networks. They're under pressure now to get married, to drop out of education. And there she is desperately trying to catch up, sharing a textbook with her peers. Um, and these are the pressing problems of now that we're made even worse by the previous problems. We did a large study, it's available online, looking at girls' um, rights and needs over the past 15 years and found that in almost every domain, girls are still doing worse than boys. Um, for in, in education, for example, we see that one in five girls has never participated in any form of education, training or skills compared to one in 10 boys. That's double the gender gap. No wonder then we see that it's girls and women who are carrying the care burden at home, looking after siblings, young children, older relatives, and dropping out of school in rapid incline the minute they start hitting adolescence and where pervasive social norms justify girls being at home. 
uh, rather than continuing their education and entering the workforce. So um, to tie us to the previous presentation, there's a very good reason why we don't see girls in STEM careers. I think somebody asked, what is STEM? STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, why we don't see girls in um, trainings like uh, engineering, or why, for example, even in UNICEF, in the sector of water and sanitation, we have just a fraction of women involved in that because very few female engineers are out there. Why does that happen? Because of stereotypes that happen even before birth that talk about girls being less capable than boys at these kinds of school subjects. So we need to work very early on to disrupt those stereotypes and work with girls and boys about their potential to do absolutely anything that they're dreaming of. So against this context, we're advocating for a primary focus on girls' skills, really working with the 600 million adolescent girls that are out there as the largest generation of future female leaders the world has ever seen. Indeed, there are more adolescents in the world than ever before. That means the largest cohort of skilled innovators, change makers, champions, activists, and future leaders. How can we support them? We need to work on multiple fronts. Um, and starting with really investing in their skills, their employability, their learning, and their personal empowerment as citizens. So equipping them with the skills they need to navigate their futures and the choices ahead of them, as well as really lifting up their voices as change makers in their communities, which they're doing already, um, and yet few of us are standing behind them. We have an approach that we call a girl-centered approach in UNICEF, which means that for any program that we're working with and for girls, first of all, if we look at the circle on the right, we want a program that girls have a say in designing themselves. For example, when we, um, in fact, I can talk to this personally, when I was designing an app when I was working in Indonesia for menstrual health for girls, where they could access on their phones information about menstrual health. How did it work, their period cycle? Where could they get asked questions about their reproductive health and rights? We realized when we gave the app to girls to review, they said, you know, we don't like this app at all. It's got wonderful pictures. It's got fantastic graphics and text but it's so flashy that it requires a really sophisticated mobile phone to download it. And most of us don't have access to mobile phones. And even if we do, we have to borrow it from our father or our brother. And they would be um, too embarrassed to let us see that kind of health, health information about our bodies. So can you please make it more discreet, black and white, less pictures, um, less bite-sized uh, uh, content? Can you please add more games so that it's more fun and interactive? So we completely revised the design. We got a panel of girls to actually help us uh, develop the scripts, develop the content. Um, and now that app is available in over 12 countries and free on Google Play if you want to download it itself. It's called Oki. And that just goes to show you the difference by designing something for girls and designing something with girls. The second is meaningful girl engagement, checking throughout any uh, program that we're delivering, that girls have a say in what we're delivering, the quality of it, did it meet their needs, how can we make it better, what do we need to change, are we reaching the right girls in the right places, are they under threat because of the types of programs we're doing, and then making sure that the skill sets that we're developing through learning and skills programs are the kinds of skills that girls lead right now. So girls are telling us they need to be able to communicate better. They don't to be able to negotiate with their own families or teachers or peers about things like intimate partner violence, dating, consent, or the kinds of studies that they'd like to have. So communication skills are what we would call soft and transferable skills. They also need hard skills so that they can start making a dent in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, and also digital skills. Overwhelmingly, it's boys and men um, that are championing in these subjects. Although girls do better at school in these subjects, when it comes to the workplace, it's male dominated. So something's happening between what girls are learning and what they're then able to practice. So making sure that we're not um, providing girls only with sewing machines, for example, but access to coding opportunities. So we have programs like this in now 18 countries, in fact, as of last week, up to 20, um, where girls are helping to decide 
what kinds of skills they need to learn and in which way. Do they want to learn it online? Do they want to have access to mentors? They need a peer group to be able to share their learning so they're not learning in isolation. Um, and they want to be able to regularly feedback with their coaches and mentors um, about the quality of the um, teaching that they're getting. Most of these um, skills programs now are online because of COVID-19 lockdowns or restricted service access, but that's also giving us some new opportunities because we really have seen a boost in digital learning, for example, helping to conquer the digital gender divide. We're also seeing there's some real cool innovations that girls themselves are coming up with, like virtual safe spaces where girls can talk about other issues like violence and sexual and reproductive health. These are just a couple of examples. For example, in Vietnam, not only are we delivering skills-based programs to girls, but the girls and our staff are actually dialoguing with government to change the official curriculums in school so that STEM becomes an, a, re a regular part of any um, education's learning in Vietnam. We also have online and in-person apprenticeships happening in countries, or in Senegal, we have digital boot camps where girls are getting together um, online and offline to learn about how to use these online learning opportunities for the maximum impact. So some reflections about this kinds of programming. What are we already learning? And especially in crisis contexts, um, like a pervasive COVID situation or the Afghanistans or the Haiti's. The first is that we need more flexible, sorry for my spelling mistake, flexible resources. That means more money for girls' organizations and networks. Just like Green Hope Foundation, there are girl-led organizations all over the world, even in the poorest and war-devastated countries. Um, those networks and organizations operate on shoestring budgets or none at all. They need the kinds of unearmarked, flexible finances to be able to prioritize what they think is most important. And few donors are doing that right now. The second is for every country to have some form of an advisory council, um, parliamentary feedback group that links policy making with young people's ideas, and especially girls who seldom have their voices heard in decision making. Uh, do girls really want a ban on child marriage? What age do they want that ban to take effect at? 16, 18, 21? These are the kinds of questions that girls need to be a part of answering and influencing. When we deliver our own programs as humanitarian development organizations, it must be automatic that we set up feedback circles where girls are telling us what's working and not working about our programs, like that example I gave you on the app. Finally, um, to really work with girls in program design and to make sure that we're measuring the success. So up till now, there is no globally agreed measure for girls' empowerment. And that seems quite astounding when you think about it. We measure things like girls' access to menstrual health and hygiene services or the prevalence of HIV amongst girls and boys. But we don't have any kind of agreed measure for governments to track how girls are feeling in terms of their decision-making power and ability to influence their confidence, their self-efficacy. Um, so that means that we've been working far too small scale. For this to become a global priority and a country priority in turn, we need those kinds of measures that hold people, um, especially policymakers, accountable. On the right, just to continue inspiring us, a young 12-year-old Raylan is working in Thailand and again, set up her own organization, network of peers, to pick up rubbish and waste in those dirty canals of Thailand. She herself is making a difference. And rather than just focus on her single story, what we're trying to do in UNICEF Thailand is to really support organizations like hers to grow, to be um, well-funded, to be self-organized, and to do what they're already doing, but at a much larger scale. Thank you so much for listening. I'm looking really forward to your feedback, your ideas, and any ways you think we can do better. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing uh, UNICEF's work uh, with us. And <clears throat> honestly, as uh, we mentioned uh, earlier, Green Hope Foundation, a lot of the things that you mentioned we've seen on the ground as well. And we remember that at one of our um, academies in the Sundarbans, in the mangrove forests, uh, one of the first uh, asks that the girls had was that a complete ban on child marriage and for them a sustainable world meant that uh, not getting married before the age of 18 or even before the age of uh, 24 so that they could actually get an education and then 
uh, get married. So thank you so much for sharing all of that amazing work. And with that, I shall invite our next panelist, Ms. Okweme uh, Okon, Barrister and National Director Administration of the International Federation of Women Lawyers. Okweme, the floor is yours. <laughs> Greetings, uh, thank you, uh, Green Hope Foundation and Daughters of the Vote for this event and this opportunity. Gender equality is an aspect of human rights. Uh, I, I believe that there's a lot that can be done to find uh, solutions to this local and global issue called gender inequality. According to the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, also known as UNICEF, gender equality means that women and men and boys and girls enjoy the same rights, resources, opportunities, and protections. So women need to, women, when I say women here, women and girls, we need to, we need to help them to enhance and maintain their self-worth. That is really very important because when they maintain that self-worth and integrity, then we can the, the, the whole solutions can really come to play. Also, lawyers and women in civic groups are encouraged to educate women on their rights. It's amazing to discover that a lot of uh, women do not really know what their rights are. So they need to be educated and they need to know. And not just educating them, we also need to. We also need to help them to disseminate these laws, make them available, make them accessible. Stakeholders, collaborators, try to make these laws, maybe in the, print them out, uh, constitutions, laws that protect their rights, distribute them, disseminate them. So we educate them on their rights and we also provide them with these documents for the literate ones to read. And even the ones that are not literate, we educate them and let them know their rights. Lawyers, I enjoined be ready at all times to defend the rights of women, even the rights of men, the rights of boys and girls, when their rights are about to be violated or when their rights are violated. Lawyers and women focused organizations and organizations generally need to ensure that indigent women enjoy full access to justice. There are other ways that we can ensure that we break this barrier of gender inequality. The challenges and impediments can definitely be surmounted. I believe they can be surmounted. And that we are, are global citizens. We are connected by a universal human culture. So gender education is essential. We can also ensure that gender balance is seen in development policies because I believe that gender, in, in, gender equality plays a role in achieving gender harmony or gender, or gender balance. And then that also helps to achieve peace. And with peace, we can achieve development. And when we are talking about gender harmony, it's important that we talk about personal harmony because personal harmony is of prime importance. If we can achieve personal harmony as individuals, then we can collectively work for, uh, for uh, a balance in, in the collective. And with personal harmony, the next thing is family as a unit. The family is a strong social unit. So every member of the family is encouraged to uphold human rights, education in the family. Accord respect to each other as they interrelate by ensuring that domestic violence, outright inequalities, oppression and injustice do not thrive in the family. So family education is also very essential. So and people in governance, when you're talking about people in governance, whether they are leaders, whether they are community leaders, and also sometimes governance doesn't necessarily mean office holding, because we are, we are potential leaders in our spaces. So people in governance need to ensure that laws and policies repugnant to women are repealed, and that harmful discriminatory practices are eliminated. Laws, policies, and practices need to be potent for the sustainable development goals that we strongly advocate and hope to achieve. Legislative advocacy is key because it also creates awareness about the laws and that protect and enforce human rights. So political education is also essential. And one of the beneficial ways that we can foster this legislative advocacy is also attitudinal change. Because even when we have the advocacy on, we also need to 
let people be oriented you know, personally because when they don't have that attitudinal change it's, it becomes tasking to enforce these laws that are really created for a civil society these positive steps there are other positive steps that could be taken some of them include affirmation action in politics and education which are enshrined in the various constitutions of various countries we should ensure that this affirmation affirmative action is reflected in our laws and we also should ensure that we develop and sustain a culture of jurisprudence on equality and this should be in line with the constitutions of our various countries I've also mentioned positive legislative advocacy through sensitization about the laws. The laws, we need to create that awareness about these laws that protect women and that ensure that their rights are also enforced as provided in the constitution. We need to support each other. We need to support each other as, as women, as mentors, mentors for girls and women. And we need to also demand for the domestic of protocols and charters. We need to foster the ratification of international laws because when they are ratified and domesticated in our various countries, it makes enforceable, uh, enforceability uh, possible. So we need to clamor for this. Also, when we talk about climate change and the, the biodiversity challenges that we experience, of course, it has there's been this, there has been negative impact on women and girls. What, what can we do? We can address this through resilience and by other means as well, because human rights and nature rights are connected. We cannot thrive in an environment that is unsafe and, and unhealthy. And so uh, we need to create the solutions for the problems that are encountered by humanity and the planet through a combination of factors, which include, but not limited to knowledge, economy, policy framework, and so on. So as we advocate the respect and protection and promotion of human rights, we must advocate nature and environmental rights, as well as environmental justice. Do the, do the young people have a role to play about to play in bringing about this change? Of course they do. The young people can do this by being positive change makers and social problem solvers in their families, in their neighborhoods, in their schools, at their workplaces, in their communities, in their countries, and the world. So volunteerism is very essential. We need to encourage our youth to volunteer to serve and to volunteer to continue this cause and to also believe in the power of individual action because from wherever you are is your stage. We don't need to wait to be in an organization. We don't need to wait to be on a very large platform, but from your own stage as a young person, from your stage as a person, you can make a positive change. You can make a positive change from your stage. Okay, so I will conclude my presentation by focusing on attitudinal dimension that I mentioned earlier, by saying that when people's mindsets are empowered, they are able to confidently stand upon a fulcrum that launches them to greatness. Thank you. Thank you so much. Open. This was really amazing to hear about how important a culture of jurisprudence is, as you said, and how it's important that women are not just aware of their uh, rights, but we actually implement the laws and policies and ensure that, you know, they are at uh, the decision making uh, table and making the laws and policies for the betterment of society. And of course, that every single individual can take action and our own zone of influence is our stage to bring about positive change. So thank you so much for speaking about that. Uh, I'd now like to invite our next uh, panelist, Dr. Elizabeth McGregor, founder of Women's Veterinary Association and Harvard Fellow Leadership. Betsy, the floor is yours. Thank you. And to the wonderful fellow panelists, I'm so excited to join you. Quick prologue. I have worked at least two decades on women and girls in science and technology and co-authored the UNESCO World, uh, World Science Report 
inaugural chapter on women, uh, the gender dimension of science and technology, as well as the Commonwealth Secretariat guidebook for mainstreaming gender in ministries of science and technology. But for today's panel, a deep dive and a perspective from the Canadian lens of getting to the decision table. If we're not at the table, we can end up on the menu. So let's take a look at how far we have come. I begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Ontario, Canada, the traditional lands of the Mississauga First Nations. And beside the beautiful artwork of Gail Sinclair are the two important reports nationally in Canada of the Truth and Reconciliation Report and its 93 calls to action and the national inquiry called Reclaiming Power and Place, an inquiry into the missing and murdered women and girls in our nation. And no future construction of equality and fairness in our globe can be approached without acknowledging our role as allies and activists in enacting their calls to action. Now, a quick glance through the Sankofa bird in the folklore of Africa to pluck from the wisdom of the past in, before we stride forward, that we have strong shoulders on which we all stand. And in this display, which is uh, in detailed in feministforum.ca from the Beijing 1995 Fourth World Conference on Women through CSW, the Global Forum, and today's panel, on the UN Sustainable Goals, we stand on strong soldier shoulders. And I just was there filled with excitement. We danced, we sang, we lobbied, we held workshops at the Fourth World Conference on Women. Kekishan mentioned the uh, founding of the World Women's Veterinary Medical Association. That's uh, the group from Rio de Janeiro when I founded it and below when we took a delegation to the Beijing uh, conference. We went championing rural girls and women and we left championing human rights in the iconic words of Hillary Rodham Clinton here seen on screen in the plenary session. Human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights once and for all. Now we each return to our own respective nations and our own respective realities. And I wanted to picture here in Canada, beneath this portrait hanging in center block of our parliament is the portrait of the fathers of confederation. It is beneath this portrait that most members of parliament are sworn into power. Do you see anyone missing? <laughs> there are three watershed moments in our nation which were breakthrough in terms of approaching equality. And the person's case championed by five feisty Alberta women, the famous five on the left, contested that women should be recognized as persons under the constitution. Our Supreme Court decided unanimously against these women in their court case. And so they appealed to the British Privy Council. And in 1929, women became recognized as persons. It's called the person's case. But women not only took to the courts, they took to the streets at the suffragists march. But it was not until 1960 in Canada that federally all women had the right to vote in our nation. And interestingly, it was not until 2017 through Bill C-16 and an amendment to the Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code that gender identity was protected under our constitution. So how far have we come in our country getting to the decision table? Canada has only ever had 13 first ministers, one prime minister and 12 premiers, heads of provinces and territories. In 1993, the Right Honourable Kim Campbell became our first female Prime Minister. And on the right are pictured seven of the 12 premiers when in 2013, they governed simultaneously. And some 87% of Canadians lived in provinces and territories led by women. Yet, six years later, there were none. This picture displays 
in the summer of 2019, the premiers of all of our territories and provinces. And in the federal election of the same year, only one of our parties was led by a woman, the Green Party led by Elizabeth May. The lesson learned here is that ground gained can be lost and we need to persist and insist and advocate and be activists to get to and remain at decision tables. Municipally across our nation, the figures are about the same. Only one fifth of our mayors in Canada are women or gender diverse individuals and one third are counselors. Pictured in the middle is Dr. Lewis, the first black mayor in Canada and North America, and also Viola Desmond, our equivalent of Rosa Parks, now pictured on her $10 bill. Um, I just quickly mentioned that we have a municipal barometer in our nation where you can look up your city council and it is reflected how many women or gender diverse individuals are represented on your council. Very exciting is the non-governmental organization called Equal Voice, which every two years sponsors Daughters of the Vote in which the 338 members of parliament send a young woman leader or gender diverse leader to their seat in the house of parliament. And here in this picture uh, being addressed by the right honorable Kim Campbell, there are more young women and gender diverse individuals than have ever been elected in the history of our nation in this one moment in time. Canada actually ranks 52nd in the world and why does it matter? Is it just numbers? Well, as all the previous speakers have said, it's far more profound, disturbing, and compelling than just a matter of numbers. Better representation reflects the demography of our nations. It results in a better process of consensus building and ultimately better policy is elaborated in the way we spend our resources as a nation and a globe. And with this in mind, I spent three years researching the book and publishing a book called Women on the Ballot, Pathways to Political Power to Inspire, Equip and Empower Women. It was based on the five times that I myself have run and included intentional intersectionality. In these 95 women, there's one prime minister, two deputy prime ministers in our nation, three premiers, 19 of the women on the screen before you have run to lead their own political parties. There are 49 firsts at all parties are represented at all political levels, including First Nation women and gender diverse individuals in leadership across our country. The youngest on screen is 23 and the most experienced, Hurricane Hazel McCallion in the top row is 93 years old. Uh, I had the youth team, six youth teams actually, 30 young Canadians who helped research and they were all volunteers and look at the spread <laughs> of both gender and uh, race and ethnicity. We uh, presented our results to the Kennedy School where I was a fellow with David Gergen and also on Parliament Hill in the bottom right hand to the Women's All-Party Caucus on, on Parliament Hill. Why do women and young gender diverse individuals take the on-ramp to get to that decision table? At the back of the book, there's a roadmap on how to get started. Also a list of campaign schools virtually and in person across our nation to tap into and internationally and model legislation to bring young women and girls and gender diverse individuals into a fair state. And I wanted to conclude this presentation by a look at the history of pandemics and the situation all of us face in our world, the most recent of which is COVID across 2000 years of pandemics. And to say that women have emerged in a very fascinating way, women that we never knew in leadership on the top of this screen is Canada's chief public health officer and to the left, one of the many uh, heads of public health in our provinces and territories, frontline workers you will all recognize. In the bottom left-hand corner is an African-American woman leader of her research at NIH or her research lab, which 
uh, created one of the uh, vaccines for COVID-19. And the Women Truckers Federation, and yes, that's all of us in the upper right-hand corner, running businesses at our table, likely in our pajama bottoms <laughs> with our kids on Zoom and our children at our laps. Women have also taken great leadership in uh, their public domain. And this I studied for two years at Harvard Medical School, looking at the global ethics of science. And in the basic distilled questions are who is at risk in a pandemic? Who is actually benefiting by what is happening? And who is making the decisions? And if you look at who risks, the way that we count, we need to count differently. Now, most of us are used to the genetic code counting vaccines and tracking and tracing and the mask and social distancing, but as well as the genetic code of our pandemic is the postal code reality or the north-south reality of housing and education and poverty and access to education. So the way that we count, you can't make policy for people that you don't see or you don't count. And who benefits? Well, as a veterinarian, uh, it's a concept which is fundamental to proceeding with our policy as discussed by the previous panelists, One Health, that animal health and human health and environmental health are inextricably linked to each other. And any policy going forward needs to address the One Health concept. And who is at the table deciding? Well, I wanted to finish with three slides. The first is of the youngest woman elected to the New Zealand Parliament, Dr. Marilyn Waring, who is a founder of Feminist Economics. And among her many books, If Women Counted, uh, introduced by Gloria Steinem, she questioned the way in which women's unremunerated, unseen and invisible work is not counted in the GDP of nations and challenged the way in which we approach the way we count people in and we measure. A tree does not just have value when it's cut and marketed as lumber, it has value in the forest. So the way that we count changes the way that we design. In our COVID response and recovery, the World YWCA produced the iceberg infographic and teaches us that if you're only addressing those parts that you are above the water level and are usually counted, then you are missing not only the credibility of policy being strong and inclusive. And this iceberg was matched by a national YWCA infographic here in Canada called the shadow pandemic, that behind COVID is the level of violence against girls and women three times greater than prior to the COVID. And finally, the plan that was produced by the Canadian YWCA with University of Toronto Rotman Institute of Gender and the Economy, Canada's first ever feminist economic recovery plan. We need to design differently, count differently and design differently. And finally, leading differently. In the first quartile of COVID, an article by Harvard Business Review asked the question, will the pandemic change our global view of women's leadership? And a fascinating study on the right-hand side by Dr. Supriya Garakapati of Liverpool University studied 200 nations in the world in the first quartile, 20 of which were led by women and asked the question, does gender matter? And her findings, the academic conclusion was there were significant improvement in the COVID deaths and COVID cases in nations led by women. And the rationale is fascinating. So I invite us all in today's panel to think about counting differently, both nationally and internationally, designing differently and leading differently. Thank you very much, Kakshan, for the opportunity to be a part of the panel. Amazing, thank you so much, Maxi, for sharing that with us. And one thing that really uh, stood out to me was that ground gain can be lost and that we can never uh, just leave the fight for gender equality, something that we have to continue to fight for and act on, uh, because if we stop, then, you know, it, we just lose that ground. So thank you so much for highlighting that and for sharing uh, Canada's history on gender equality and how much more we have to do to ensure complete gender parity. So thank you. And with that, I invite our next speaker, Ms. Pragna Vasupal, 
Head of Events of Green Hope Foundation. Ragna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kekashan. And hello, everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to be a part of such an amazing panel. I first noticed gender-based assumptions at a young age when my parents told me to return home before 9 p.m. Or when I noticed that feminine hygiene was a taboo topic. I noticed gender inequality when adjectives such as selfish, opinionated, and bossy are used to describe strong and powerful women. Or when women experience casual sexism at the workplace. As a young girl, I questioned and rebelled against these cultural norms and gender bias, only to grow up and realize that the problem is deeply rooted in our societies. These examples show the surface level intensity of the grave injustice women and girls face around the world, which is why discussions such as these are pivotal to rise against gender-based discriminations. So it is my honor and privilege to be a part of this panel, surrounded by such amazing, powerful leaders of our society who serve as role models to young women, including myself. It is no question that we all agree with this statement that gender equality is a basic human right. Yet, women and girls have been facing gender disparity for centuries. Throughout history, it can be observed that women have continually been oppressed by the patriarchal system, which inherently promotes this gender bias rooted in society even today. The coexistence of other group-based oppression with sexism in these patriarchal social structures is further disadvantages to women, particularly those facing discrimination due to race, ethnicity, class, and more. Gender equality cannot be achieved unless we realize that the challenges are often regional and even community specific. Let me give you two examples. The World Economic Forum recently ranked the United States as 19th in the world on its gender gap index, with women comprising less than one fifth of elected members of Congress. The report identifies political empowerment as the greatest gender equity issue for the United States. Whereas in Somalia, 95% of girls aged from 17 to 16 have never been to school. This is the highest instance of educational inequality found worldwide. These two instances have the same fundamental issue of gender inequality. However, they need to be approached dis differently. This proves the need for local solutions to solve this global human rights issue. This is the main essence of our work at Green Hope Foundation. We focus on highlighting local problems and encouraging the youth and women of that society to come up with local solutions. Gender equality is an integral part of Green Hope Foundation. And our work is on feminist sustainable development, where we focus on empowering women, especially in marginalized societies, as they are the ones most left behind. They live in areas affected most by climate change induced disasters, such as floods, storms, typhoons, which only exacerbate the inequalities they face because of their gender. We work on clean water and sanitation, skills building through education, sustainable fishing, and conduct workshops on how to protect themselves and their children from sexual assault. In Bangladesh, we are providing training on sustainable agriculture, along with providing organic seeds to COVID affected communities to end hunger. We are transforming women into poultry farming entrepreneurs through livestock distribution. These rural women leaders created through the establishment of a local circular economy are now sending their children and the girls to school instead of them being forced to sell their daughters into child marriage and have transformed into decision makers. 
which was previously unheard of in their society. We have successfully implemented another project of ours, a sewing school in rural Bangladesh that is helping to reduce inequalities by providing women from this conservative rural community with the skills and the means to become economically self-reliant. Women are affected differently and more severely by climate change and its impacts because of social roles, discrimination, and poverty. And the recent COVID pandemic has revealed the depth and intensity of gender-based discrimination and violence. Governments play an integral role in ensuring that the public sector fosters gender equality within society as a whole. A way of ensuring a gender balance in development policies following the intersection with climate change is by increasing the collection and use of data on the gender environment nexus. This was Green Oak Foundation's proposal as part of the UN Women Action Coalition for Feminist Action on Climate Justice. We highlighted the importance of the de development of this aggregated data by social factors, including age, race, socioeconomic status, sexuality, marital status, disability, literacy levels, to ensure a more intersectional data collection and distribution in relation to environmental challenges. The lack of disaggregated data to represent the unique challenges faced by women and girls hinders the progress of creating a resilient future where no one is left behind. We have also planted fruit trees with women for food security and to stop land degradation. Young people play an integral role in building forward equal. We have the influence to make a meaningful difference in our own zones of influence by raising awareness and standing up against the gender disparity that we face in our day-to-day -day lives. As the current and future generations of this planet, we have the responsibility to educate ourselves and each other about the challenges faced and work together to resolve these challenges to build an equitable future for all of us. To empower young girls, we have launched our mobile libraries. This way, we fulfill our goal to leave no one behind. Due to the pandemic, these girls have not been able to attend school. We conduct academies, but everyone can't come to these academies and workshops. So we decided to bring education to their doorstep. This is also in congruence with SDG 7, Clean Energy, as our mobile libraries are solar powered. We strongly believe in the implementation of clean energy to mitigate climate change, which is why we have also provided clean energy to schools by installing solar panels in schools in Liberia and Bangladesh. We are also powering homes so that women and girls can study at night. These solar panels power our computer literacy training programs for girls so that they have the necessary skill sets to be leaders in the economy and uplift their communities. We have also installed solar streetlights in Liberia for the safety of women. I would like to conclude by saying that guaranteeing the rights of women and giving them opportunities to reach their full potential is critical, not only for attaining gender equality, but also for meeting a wide range of international development goals. Empowered women and girls contribute to the health and productivity of their families, communities, and countries, creating a ripple effect that benefits everyone. Enough of talking. We need solutions on the ground and women and girls at the decision-making table walking the talk. By empowering women and uplifting girls, we stand a chance of building an equitable, just, and prosperous future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing Green Hope Foundation's work. And absolutely, uh, by empowering women, uplifting girls, we can definitely create the gender equal world for all.
So thank you once again. And with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for sharing uh, your perspectives with us today. This has been so, so inspiring. And I am sure that we, we had a lot of questions in uh, the Q&A box already. And it's really amazing to see the discussion there. I do see that we have some raised hands as well. So uh, Anshita, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Panelist, for this amazing discussion. And my question is, we risk of losing an entire generation of girls who have dropped out of school due to COVID-19. How do we address this issue? And it is especially rampant in the global south. Awesome. Thank you, Anshita, for your question. Uh, would any of our panelists like to take that? I'm happy to share what I can. Uh, thank you, Anshita. I think what you have highlighted is our absolute top priority as UNICEF. And our message is that schools should be the last to close and the first to open. And the way that we're getting that message out is through um, broad-based advocacy and communications, raising awareness with parents, with community leaders, with young people themselves, that um, the evidence shows us that Infections in schools is the least of our worries and to really follow science. Um, the second is high level dialogues with governments um, as they're making plans to cope with the crisis, when schools shut down, under what circumstances, when masks are worn, who should wear the masks, what's the access to testing. So really providing that technical um, advisory to governments and making sure they're getting the right information. And the third is an active research agenda. There's still a lot about COVID-19 that we don't understand, the Delta variant, for example, how it's impacting children. And so working with um, some of the best scientists in the world to really track what's happening at schools and out of schools so that we can get the very best information to people who have to make decisions. So it's particularly on the first point, um, community-based advocacy then. So long as we can have bars and restaurants open, schools must be open. Um, and where schools cannot be open, alternative pathways must be made available, whether online um, or special visits, home-based visits with vaccinated professionals and other solutions. And countries are already really employing creative options, but we know that the situation is really critical. I mean, it's been 18 months for many children, especially in the countries that you're talking about, Anshita. So um, we need to make more noise about this. For some reason, um, this issue still seems to be not a top priority for governments. Amazing, thank you. Uh, Lauren, would any of our other panelists like to answer uh, the question? Uh, if not, then uh, Madhumita, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, I'm Madhumita from Dubai. Um, thank you so much for this inspiring discussion. Actually, my question was, um, the challenges that women face are different according to age groups, but there's very little being done to focus mitigation efforts based on this metric. What are your suggestions in this regard? Amazing. Thank you, Madhumita. And since I'm cognizant of time, I shall now give the floor to Otobi. Otobi, the floor is yours. If you can unmute. Uh, you're on mute, Padavi. Hello, everyone. I am Otubi from Bangladesh. Thank you, panelists. I live in a rural community. I think it is easier to have gender equality in cities. My question is, how can we make sure that rural communities globally have gender equality too? Amazing. Thank you, Otobi. So, uh, panelists, over to you. Start, and it relates to I believe it was uh, Lauren that mentioned. You know, we not, we should not only have programs that help people, but empower people to be agent of change. And if we can empower women and youth in the rural area to be the agent of change in their communities, um, that's the only way that we're gonna we're gonna get there. And how do we do that? Well. They are, of course, Ongtada always comes at these things with an economic angle because that's that's our mandate, that's what we do. But one of the major issue has been, you know, we have to look at the linkages and oftentimes the problem is 
we gonna we just like ministries the un is divided in silos so somebody works on agriculture somebody on food security somebody on uh, education somebody and we need to stack these things and we need to find solutions that are people and planet centered that respond stack the issues and find solution otherwise we're just putting uh, plasters on different holes and not fixing the whole problem that are systemic, as we mentioned. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Chantelin. Uh, would anyone else like to answer that? I can jump in. I, I'm sorry I couldn't quite hear clearly the full question, but certainly when I founded the World Women's Veterinary Medical Association, it provided um, some women who were models in the countryside and champions of very local situations, the ability to help advance situations because of the uh, role that they had in leading in the rural sector. So it may be that women such as women veterinarians are a source that you might tap into. Amazing, thank you, Betty. Ukpeme, I saw you on mute. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll add that you know, gender rights are human rights. And when we talk about empowerment, empowerment transcends uh, financial empowerment. And so education is a very uh, viable empowerment tool. So we need to continue to enhance awareness. And that's one way that we can get the message across. We can, we can teach people about gender education. So even in the rural areas or even to people who are not literate you know, to read the laws that provide for their rights, where they can really see where their rights are provided for by their various laws. We can do this by you know, teaching them their rights in the language or in the way that they understand. So they can be empowered through knowledge, and that can be done through gender education. And so stakeholders, organizations, and individuals who are knowledgeable in this area can help us to spread this word across the globe. Thank you. Thank you. Pemeba, Pragna, your hand is raised. Uh, I would like to answer Madhumita's question on how women uh, are affected uh, differently throughout their in different age groups and that there's not enough attention paid to that. So I think the first step, as I mentioned in my speech, would be to uh, for the development of disaggregated data, because there isn't much data in the first place to uh, create meaningful action. So if we collect the data and, uh, and then we can spread awareness about the issues and make meaningful change. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Pragna. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of our, uh, well, our audience members for their questions, both in the Q&A box as well as uh, live. And they were really, really pertinent questions. And I'd also like to thank our panelists for uh, answering uh, the questions. Uh, very quickly, now I'd like to request our panelists to uh, give their concluding remarks in, uh, in 30 seconds. So we'll go in reverse order. So Pragna, the floor is yours. Yeah, so I would just like to conclude by saying that it's time for change and it's time that we all stand up against the gender-based discrimination that we face every day. And this we can do this only if we work together. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Pragna. Betsy? Well, uh, we all are united globally for the girls and women in Afghanistan in this moment of crisis and anything that we can do individually or organizationally to support uh, this situation and lift them up is extremely important for us to undertake. I encourage us to count differently, design differently and lead differently. If we're not at the decision table and on, we could be on the menu. So to step forward and put your name on the ballot or offer yourself to run at whatever level for whatever position and know that you have support globally for your courage and your credibility is needed to be heard in the world. Thanks, Kekishan. Thank you, Vetsi Ukpeme. Uh, women and girls have experienced numerous inequalities and injustices globally. Uh, the goal of equality among others is equal rights, equal opportunities, equal access, which culminates in equality, harmony, 
peace, justice, and development. We can break the barriers of gender inequality. Let us break the barriers of inequality. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okpeme, uh, Lauren? It's hard to follow up these excellent speakers. I think maybe I'll start with one fact and one ask. The fact is that research has shown us that what moves the needle on gender equality um, is a range of factors, but most powerfully are women and girls movements. So when we see a change in child marriage laws, when we see um, more parity in the workplaces, when we see more women in business, um, when we see more female presidents, when we see a, a reduction in gender-based violence in homes, a common thread from country to country all over the world is the impact of women and girls movements. So organizing for change, there is no more powerful tool for change. Um, and so I encourage all of you to keep doing what you're doing, keep asking the hard questions, lift each other up. Um, confidence is a huge um, factor for girls' participation. So if there's a girl that you know that you can uplift, um, congratulate, affirm, stand together with, do it. <laughs> if there's a woman who needs to hear your positive feedback, give it. Um, and if there's somebody is cool that you can unite behind, go for it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lauren. Chantilly? Thank you so much. All very, very good advice and hard act to follow. So I'd say, as we've seen in this, in this panel, um, ends on, on the ground, activism, advocacy is needed. And so thank you so much, uh, ladies from the Green Hope for the work that you're doing. But one, one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking is, you know, you're interacting with a lot of people in Bangladesh and several countries. One of the problems we're having is we do not have a registry of women innovation and good ideas, institutional innovation and technological innovation on the ground. I think we need to start the movement, the feminist movement, to start documenting that, creating a registry so we can actually sh channel mentorship, entrepreneurship skills, and investment to them. Because until now, until then, it's going to be the high level, sophisticated technologies that are not appropriate for developing countries from Silicon Valley and, and Cambridge that are going to be funded unless we manage to identify these innovations to be funded. The other thing is we need men to bring men with us. We need to educate men. Most men do not want to be in this situation. They don't support inequality, but they don't know how to act. They don't even know how to speak about it anymore. So we need to help them as well. And finally, you children, ask your leaders, your dean, your president of universities, they are not educating you for the world that you're facing right now. You, they need to teach you, go back to their original mandate, which is creating change agent, let, helping you help the communities in which you live. And so you can actually put pressure on your university to be more hands on in your community, but also train you for the world that we're facing. Amazing. Thank you so much, Chantelyn. With that, I just like once again, I want to thank all of our panelists. This was such a powerful discussion and you've all brought in such compelling perspectives to this critically important subject of achieving the societal resilience through gender equity. And as all of you have highlighted, it requires this endemic change in our mindsets, in our deep-seated cis-heteropatriarchal processes, and really uprooting, which will require the cohesive efforts and you know this passion. And that is where all of us uh, come in uh, to shrug off these past biases and uh, you know, view gender challenges through a human and planetary lens and really treating every obstacle as an opportunity for a change. And of course, we must endeavor to accelerate the process of assimilating disaggregated gender data, in particular collected by women and girls on the ground who live through the challenges because what gets measured gets done. So I would also like to acknowledge and thank Daughters of the Vote for their support in making this webinar possible. And thank you once again to our panelists, to our global audience. Together, let us change the narrative. Please stay safe, take very, very good care of yourselves and your loved ones. And we look forward to engaging with you at our next webinar coming very soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Here, bye.